Hey everybody, aloha. Welcome to live Q&A here at Trauma Recovery University. I'm your host, Athena Moberg. And first, before we get started, I just want to say welcome if this is your very, very, very first time here with us. This is live and it's interactive and it's Q&A. <laughs> Usually we have a different topic every single week. And this week's topic is healthy communication. So um, normally I will issue a trigger warning and get you all your contact information before we go ahead and get started on our weekly Q&A. So if you're in the United States and you happen to be triggered, um, please reach out. This is not crisis. This is not a crisis care uh, video. I am not equipped <laughs> for crisis care. So I want you to get the support you need and deserve. And in order to do that, I would love for you to reach out to our friends over at RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network. And they can be reached at rainn.org, or you can reach them on the telephone and speak with them live, 1-800-656-HOPE, H-O-P-E. So if you're located outside the United States and you're in Canada, uh, reach out to our friends over at the Gatehouse. Um, and I will get contact information for them as, as soon as I can. Our friend Stu is with the Gatehouse, and they provide wonderful resources for abuse survivors. And if you are located in the UK, we would love for you to reach out to our friends at the Samaritans. They actually have email support where you can email back and forth. Again, it's not um, crisis care, but they do respond to emails. You can find them on Twitter at Samaritans, or you can email one of their staff members, her name is Jo, J-O, at Samaritans.org. I don't have all of the text message information for the suicide hotlines and for the Samaritans, um, but um, in the coming weeks, I will have an intern, um, a volunteer perhaps, um, get me all of that information or be here with us on the feed where we can um, tweet that out to you and even post it maybe um, down in the comments or in the chat feed or um, perhaps even um, have um, all of the crisis information put in the description of this video before the video even starts. That way, if you're triggered during this video due to um, previous trauma or just if anything I'm talking about is triggering for you, then you could just page right on down into the comment section or right before the comment section in the description of this video so that you will be able to get the proper care that you deserve. So without further ado, I am going to go into um, top, the topic tonight, which is healthy communication. And, you know, interestingly, this topic was um, suggested several different times from several different people in our community. And um, the way we get our topics, are all they're all from you guys. <laughs> you guys are the ones that tell us everything that you would like us to record videos about. And when we receive a topic suggestion, usually it's, hey, Athena, could you discuss this topic? And then there's like huge paragraphs filled with different examples of what happened. And then, you know, thank you so much for addressing this topic. So there are so many different um, types of communication and different styles of communication and the reason that sticks out the most for this topic in um, just in general of healthy communication um, the reason this topic sticks out the most for our community members if you are here on this channel likely you are an adult survivor of childhood abuse maybe even childhood sexual abuse maybe even human trafficking so if that's you or perhaps you're an adult survivor of a different type of abusive relationships. Um, perhaps you're an adult who is married to someone who's extremely toxic or possibly personality disordered or very predatory in nature. 
um, someone who lacks empathy, someone who lacks a conscience. Um, but regardless of who, who you are and why it is that you're here in the relationship that you were in that was toxic or abusive, communication is something that we all do on a daily basis, even if we're alone. It's how we communicate with ourselves, our thought life. Our thought life is a really big deal, and I'll probably do a separate video to address that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna address today, in the beginning of this video, healthy communication, um, just daily communication. So for instance, interpersonal communication for survivors, when, when an adult survivor of childhood abuse is raised in a toxic family of origin or an abusive or violent home, Healthy communication is not modeled for them. And so oftentimes the only healthy communication they see is at school perhaps with teachers or, and then even, even more, the communication with teachers or, with, or among students, sometimes that might not be health, the healthiest example of communication or like how we should communicate in a healthy way. So I want to address those things and I want to really validate that if you are struggling with communication, I have several different examples that I'll point out today. A couple of examples are someone who um, was forced to be quiet their entire lives and so now they struggle um, it, even speaking, speaking up for themselves. Um, another, be, because they were forced to be mute. Their, during their growing up years, their formative years, and their developmental years, and even into young adulthood. So that's if you're isolated or if you're forced to be quiet, or if you learn at a very young age that communicating isn't something that's safe, then you will tend to hide or not communicate. And then the whole other end of the spectrum, right, because abuse is like usually polar opposites, there are silent, silent, quiet, quiet, and then there's the explosive. So if you lived in, in a home that was abusive in nature or toxic, and there were often um, explosive episodes of rage or cursing or manipulation or verbal abuse or just loud, violent outbursts, then you, you either, one of two things happens. You will grow up and you'll communicate in that way and you won't know anything's wrong with that. Like, I didn't realize that cursing every other word and um, screaming and yelling wasn't a natural, normal, and even healthy way to communicate. I didn't even realize that. Because the home that I was raised in, I was raised where there was a lot of yelling and screaming and healthy communication wasn't something that, was honored or taught or modeled for me. So if, if that is you and you're struggling with um, either one end of the spectrum, which is not speaking up and not knowing what words to use or how to communicate, or if you were raised in explosive rage uh, environment where you tend to overreact or raise your voice a lot or curse or whatever, and, and we, we fall somewhere on the spectrum. Communication is a spectrum. And healthy communication is super important in order for you to have healthy interpersonal relationships. The relationship you have with yourself, again, I'll record a totally different video regarding the communication that we have with ourselves. Um, but as basic as how you communicate, being able to speak up for yourself um, in friendships with other people, Coworkers, um, or the way you speak with loved ones and family members who either are or are not the loved ones from your to toxic family of origin, or how it is that you would speak, um, how it is that you would speak up in the workplace to assert yourself in areas that you would typically need to assert yourself in order for you to accomplish what it is that you need to accomplish for your job. So all of these different things, and we haven't even crossed the line over into romantic relationships yet. That's a whole nother ball game as well. And this can all feel very scary for the adult survivor. Communication can feel scary. I just want to say that loud and clear. I don't want to skirt over that. 
tonight's conversation is going to be very different than any other video on this channel because I I'm not going to share a one page. I'm going to I'm going to actually share emails and comments from people, just screen shares of their actual words. So you know, like these are things that people are struggling with. These are topics that people are struggling with. And you might go, oh my gosh, I totally relate relate to that. I thought it was just me. Um, I just want you to know that you're not alone. And I also want to share something very, very personal with you. Okay. Um, a lot of you know me. For, for those of you who are brand new and you don't know me, um, I'm so happy that you're here. My name is Athena Moberg. I'm an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse and exploitation. And I um, was raised in a very violent and abusive environment and stayed in very close contact with very abusive and toxic people until I, um, very close, as in like under the same roof, until I was in my early 20s. And then I even stayed very close geographically for another 10 years as well. It took me a really long time to heal from the, um, the scrambling. <laughs> my eggs were completely scrambled up there. <laughs> and it takes a while to heal. So um, I, I joke sometimes, uh, at least it elicits some laughs, but it, it's not really a joke. It's actually very serious. Let me plug my computer in here. Um, I was socially inept <laughs> when I was in school. I, I grew up and I lived in um, many different places. I was um, born in Ohio, raised all over different parts of California, lived in Florida, um, went to six different elementary schools. Um, my mom was married several times to a lot of abusive people who were alcoholics or um, just abusive in many other ways, sexually abusive, physically abusive, verbally abusive, emotionally abusive. Um, there was a lot of abuse. and. I was socially inept. I didn't have a vocabulary. I failed vocabulary tests, and I just I did pretty well in school. Like I studied and stuff, but um, but I didn't really excel. Uh, I was I, I was busy surviving and really just trying to um, navigate the waters of where I was uh, living living with um, different people in different environments and I never quite really found my bearings and um, it was hard for me. So communicating was a struggle. And when I finally did find my voice and I did begin to communicate and I begged, 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 begged one of my family members to allow me to go to this um, modeling school where um, they teach you um, uh, poise and manners and and um, like etiquette. <laughs> And I remember just really struggling in all those different areas and not really knowing um, my way around. And even in school, I just always felt very awkward, like everybody was sort of staring. And no one, I don't think, would have really known it. I mean, some people knew it, but, you know, whatever, they were the mean people. But I struggled with communicating. And when I got away and I had a child of my own when I was 18, or actually I turned 19, and then had him three days later. So I almost gave birth on my 19th birthday. But um, communicating was a struggle, and I didn't want my child to grow up the way I grew up, and I wanted to learn how to communicate effectively. It was something I was really passionate about at a very, very young age, and I began studying verbal communication, nonverbal communication, um, social cues, etiquette, um, business correspondence, um, just... I began studying communication and really wanted to know how to communicate more effectively so that I could land a good job and so that I could be a good mom and so that I could teach my child how to communicate and so that he wouldn't be socially inept like I was. So it was difficult. It was painful. But I want you to know that the tools that you need are necessary. They're out there. Um, the tools that you need that are necessary, they are out there. And I want you to feel safe enough at, in your own time, at your own pace, that you reach out and you connect with a community of safe people that will allow you to practice healthy communication in your own time and learn those communication skills. 
Conflict resolution is something that's a really big deal. That's a whole nother level of communication. Um, I would love to go into greater detail, um, but I want to know what you guys want. So if you guys would let me know down in the comments, do you want to learn more about verbal communication, nonverbal communication, professional correspondence, interpersonal relationships, conflict resolution? Um, there are a lot of different types of communication, and I want to make sure that I'm covering the ones that you want me to. Um, and I'm just so happy that you're here, and I'm so happy you are um, supporting one another. Typically, I would be on the Twitter stream hanging out with you guys using the hashtag no more shame, where you can send your questions, or you can post your questions right down in the comment section of this video, and I'll do my very best to respond to them. There's also a YouTube chat box going on over there. Um, if you received an invite from me or from someone to come tonight, then I'm so excited that you're here. I'm going to get into answering other, um, answering your guys' questions. I just want you um, to know. Oh my gosh, Christy, I miss you. I haven't seen you in so long. Hi, Christy. Um, and welcome to welcome to Sammy. I don't think I've met you before, Sammy. I think we just started following each other. So welcome, welcome to Sammy. I hope you guys have welcomed Sammy underscore S N S T. Um, I'm so happy you're here. Hi, Kalisha, Vinny, Vinny, you're so sweet. Um, Christy, we miss you too. Hi, Heather. Hi, Jody. Oh my goodness, I'm not retweeting you all, and like I'm just looking for questions. Hi, Jack. Hi, Heather. Um, oh my goodness, yeah, it is a really, really long list. Hi, Shane. I hope you're watching, or I don't know if you're if you are just um, on the Twitter stream only, or if you're watching on YouTube. But I want to welcome you, Shane, because I'm not sure how many times you've been here with us. But I'm so excited that you all are here. So um, I want to do some screen shares. I want to I want to answer some people's questions, if that's okay with you guys. And um, first and foremost, I want to um, just let you know that um, I don't know if I can do a screen share on one of these. I have one question that I will answer um, because it is it's regarding communication and um, feelings of abandonment. And then I will go in and I will do some screen shares on other people's questions, probably not all related to the topic of communication, but they are questions from you guys, and you're the ones that matter. You, this is all for you guys. So here we go. Um, all right. When I, um, this is a question sent in by Joey. I hope it's okay that I, that I share your identity. Everybody else, I blacked out on all of my screen shares, so no one knows who anybody is. Um, okay, let's see. When I was growing up, I always made friends, but then I lost them because of my past and because of my mother. I always felt abandoned. Now, now I, I do have an amazing friend who is there for me, but she also has PTSD, PTSD. And when she's depressed and she want, has her moments, she wants to be left alone. And when I don't hear from her for days, I always get anxiety and I feel abandoned. How do I stop feeling this way? Okay, I'm gonna address two things, Joey. Here we go, I'm gonna sit up here. Okay, I'm gonna address two things, okay? I am going to address the fact that um, you made friends and then you lost them and that caused you to feel abandoned and then I'm going to address Someone else in your life who is having some natural healthy separateness and how that causes you to also feel abandoned and Then we'll address the topic of how to not feel that way because I don't think it's a realistic goal to say How do I stop feeling this way because your feelings are valid feelings are indicators so for instance you are feeling abandoned now because it reminds you of how you felt when you were younger, when you made friends and then you lost them because of your mom or because of your past. Now, um, I happen to have the, the privilege of knowing a little bit about what it is you're talking about when you say your past. 
So I'm assuming you mean your abuse history, and when you say because of your mother, it's um, I'm assuming that what you mean is that your mother was not okay with you having friends, and so she sabotaged those relationships. So there's a lot going on here. I want to I want to point out that you making friends when you were younger is super awesome, and it further proves that you're lovable and likable. And a lot of times as survivors, we don't think we're lovable or likable. So A, you're lovable and likable. You made friends. You lost friends because your mom sabotaged those friendships. So there's a betrayal going on there. So someone who is supposed to take care of you and love you and nurture you and show you unconditional love is not only not showing you unconditional love and protecting you and nurturing you and and being kind to you, but she's sabotaging your friendships because she's jealous of you spending time with anybody but her. And that is very, very, very unhealthy. It's unhealthy in every dynamic. If you have one friend who tries to sabotage your other friendships because they get jealous that you hang out with anybody but them, that's a toxic friend. If you have a boyfriend, who likes to sabotage all of your relationships, including the relationships you have with your siblings or your cousins or your parents, and sabotages all of your relationships or your friendships or your relationships you have with colleagues because they're likely jealous of you hanging out with or spending time with anybody but them, that's a toxic relationship. So I spoke in Florida last year at a church several times, and one of the topics that I spoke on was being able to recognize abuse and toxicity in relationships. And believe it or not, this affects our communication because it's traumatizing. And during traumatization, we either fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And fight is you get aggressive, flight is you bail, Freeze is you freeze, and fawn is you try to reason your way into it and out of it. You figure it all out, you make excuses for all of it, and then you talk your way through it, around it, over it, and and just figure it all out with, with moving as close to the situation, verbally, physically, emotionally, or otherwise, so that you can make it all better. Fix it. Fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. So let's, let's think about this, these friendships that you had. You had friendships, and they were great. And then you were betrayed by someone, so there's betrayal, and then you lost your friends, and you felt abandoned. So there's betrayal, there's abandonment, and you're also living with PTSD from trauma, from being sexually abused and otherwise abused, whether or not your abuse was sexual in nature or not, if you were emotionally abused, verbally abused, physically abused, financial ritual abuse, ritual abuse, like religious abuse, like people who use the Bible and twist scriptures and say things, and they say it's scriptural because it's scripture, and but they're twisting it for their own purposes to, to manipulate you and exploit you and make sure that you're doing whatever it is that they want you to do, that is hardcore abuse. Not only are you being betrayed, but your eggs are being scrambled. And it like you can't unbake a cake. You can't unscramble an egg. Like that's some permanent damage that's going on. So we're dealing with betrayal, we're dealing with abandonment, we're dealing with trauma. And your final question is how do I stop feeling this way? I don't want to say that there's no hope because there's always hope, but it is not likely that you're going to just poof, stop feeling that way. It's going to take a lot of establishing and maintaining very healthy boundaries in your life and seeking out those safe people that inspire you and build you up and want what's best for you and really Keeping, establishing, again, establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries with people who are toxic. Keeping them out of your sphere of influence. And I know personally that, Joey, you are in the midst of doing that. You're in the midst of making sure that you're not around so much vulgar behavior and manipulative behavior in your life. 
and people who use you as a doormat. Um, and I'm proud of you for doing that. I don't think it's a realistic goal for you to not feel that way or stop feeling that way. I think as you, in time, I, I think the answer is time. Time and healthy choices, Joey. Over time and with healthy choices, establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries and believing that you're worth having healthy friendships, those are big. Those are big, and you're going to begin to feel better. Now, I want to address your friend that you have now who lives with PTSD and depression and steps away and needs her healthy separateness, her space, and it causes you, it triggers an abandonment feeling in you. If there's a way for you to remain in the present and really practice mindfulness, notice what's around you. What color are the walls? What are you smelling? What are you hearing? How do you feel? Think about your toes all the way up your body, all the way to the tip of your head, like your toes and then your feet and then your calves and your knees and your legs and just, and really focus on your body parts and maybe step outside or maybe practice some grounding skills. I, I recorded some videos on some of these topics and I know that some of the people in the, in the um, Twitter stream and, and YouTube might be able to post some links to some videos that might help you with grounding strategies and mindfulness and that will help you to develop resiliency and begin to feel better and not feel like, because you could communicate with your friend and say, when you are having a PTSD episode or feeling depressed and you pull away, when you, I feel abandoned. I realize that you're not abandoning me in my mind. Cognitively, I realize you're not abandoning me, but I'm still feeling abandoned. And I just wanted you to know that I'm working on it's no, there's nothing for you to do. I don't need you to fix me, but I'm recognizing this in myself and I'm working on becoming a healthier communicator. And I just want you to know I care. Then, and as I can be available to support you, I absolutely will. So, I mean, there's some help. There's some, like, um, good communication for you. You guys, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm going to be sneezing any second here. We have a weird weather pattern going on here, um, and there's a lot of pollution in the air. And um, my eyes have been really, really itchy in my nose, and so I apologize if I'm um, sneezing or if I have to, like, mute everything or whatever. So, Joey, I hope that helps you. I'm going to move on to some other questions. Um, Hey, hi Sue. Hi Sue, shiny blue dress. She's on her on her break right now at work and she decided to stop by and say hello to all of us. So hello Sue. Um, I'm gonna share an email that I got with you guys um, from someone. Um, this And I'm gonna go through these as quickly as I possibly can, okay? Because I wanna make sure I get to as many as possible. Let me see if there's anything. Um, here that I can. Yes, keeping toxic people out of your sphere of influence is so important. Um, oh, yes, Shane, feelings are indicators. Yes, your four-way flashers are going berserk. Yes, well, if you're feeling frightened, then there's a reason. Um, Oh, uh, let's see. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Destiny. Oh my goodness, I'm 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 paging through everything really really quickly. Um. Okay, I'm gonna do some screen shares. I'm sorry for the going all around here. Um, let's do some screen shares. That way, you guys can. Hopefully, other people will. Um, this is a good one for Heather too, but actually. Heather Tuba, I know you're live right now, and this is an email from a, a supporter, a spouse of a survivor. I totally thought of you. So um, if you have some comments or uh, some things that you want to tweet out or share in the comments of the video or anything, um, please feel free. So I'm going to share. This is anonymous. I hope you guys can see that. Oh, my goodness. I hope you can see the screen share. 
Okay, I'm going to read this for those of you who are driving. And by the way, if you're on a podcast platform like iTunes or Stitcher, thank you so much for being here. I just want to let you know that we have a Roku TV channel and a YouTube channel, and you can find us by looking for Trauma Recovery University. So um, here's an anonymous letter that I received. Um, I know who it was sent to me from. I don't know them personally, but I just left them out because um, I want to make sure that I protect their confidentiality. So um, he says, hello, I have been following some of your webcasts on YouTube as a spouse of a childhood sexual abuse survivor. In supporting my wife and her healing, we have come to the point where she is agonizing as someone who recently admitted her victimization to me, whether as a 40 year old, now the wife is 40, whether she should report her abuser, a coach who is living in another state, with the pending events of a detailed testimony to a total stranger, in parentheses, a detective, as part of the investigation, her high school friends finding out the hidden abuse as a duplicitous life, her abuser manipulated her to keep covered up, etc., and all of that type of aftermath. The statute of limitations due to her age and the time of victimization over 12 years ago, in, oh no, she was over 12 years old, in Florida, the statute of limitations has expired. So the likelihood of any prosecution would be minimal and not probable. This would also give the abuser a chance to shame her again, especially with the advent of social media, which was not available 20 years ago. So what would the benefits of, be of reporting? What would it accomplish? And what can she articulate she wants other than to put it behind her? And would reporting to law enforcement accomplish this at this stage? If you have some materials or a webcast I did not see and you could point me to or have answers from your experience or other testimonies, testimonies, I would appreciate it. Thanks for the earnest work with survivors. Well, you are welcome, sir. Thank you for the awesome, concise email. I want to address some things here. Okay, first of all, this man is a supporter and he's stepping up and he's watching videos and he is he's supporting his wife secondly his wife is 40 now remember you guys know if you've been here on this channel for any length of time women in my personal experience with dealing with survivors and working with survivors for a while now and in my own recovery journey which has been almost 17 years I know that women tend to recall their repressed memories between the ages of 35 and 45. Men, on the other hand, tend to recall their memories between the ages of 40 and 50. So the fact that she's 40 and she has been recalling her memories is super duper normal. So I wanna tell you, the husband of this awesome, brave survivor woman, that it is, first thing I would tell her is it is completely common that you are 40 and that you're having these memories. It is likely that you have sort of been slowly having these memories over the past five years, and you're wondering if they're even true, and now you're like, you know what? I get it. Like, I can't refute it anymore. Yes, I am a survivor. Yes, I was victimized by this coach of mine, and he lives in this other state, and, I, and I'm agonizing over the thought of telling this detective, who's a total stranger, who's gonna try to investigate him, and then all of my high school friends finding out and having it be this big public trial. And um, I mean, seriously, like I'll, I wanna validate your feelings, you, the survivor. I wanna validate your feelings that this is a terrifying thing to try to take on. Um, it, is, it is something that I wanna share with you that, that choosing the choice you have to prosecute is your choice and your choice alone. Hey, Harriet, um, could you please pop up the thumbnail in the top of the of the webcast here? Like pop a thumbnail up at the top of the screen to the video titled Your Choice to Press Charges. And then on the other side of the screen, could you please pop up a thumbnail that talks about when the justice system fails? Um, thank you so much, Harriet. Okay, so if you're on a replay, you'll be able to hopefully see some thumbnails here, and you can click on those, and then they're kind of long videos, so if you want, you can fast forward to where the one page is. All you have to do is go down into the bottom of the description section and click on a number, and it'll take you right to the one page. So 
I want to be very clear when I say this. Your feelings are valid. You, the husband, you're amazing. High fives all over the place. And, and you, the survivor, you're incredibly brave to even consider this. Given the fact that the statute of limitations um, and everything, all the other details um, that, you, that you've shared uh, in this video, I want to share with you that you do not need to report in order to heal. If I were you, the 40-year-old, and I was vacillating in, in the midst of all these choices and going back and forth and really um, stressing out and, and, and um, as, as, it's, as it's so perfectly put in the email, agonizing. If I, were, if I were you and I was agonizing over all of this and considering the whole picture, I would want someone to tell me if it was true whether or not I could heal without reporting my abuse. I wouldn't want someone to tell me to report or not to report, but I would want to know if I needed to report in order to heal. So I want to tell you loud and clear right now that in order for you to heal and, and feel hopeful and um, allow those deepest, darkest parts of you to be open to healing, I want you to know that you do not need to report in order for those things to happen. You must, you must call abuse abuse, which it, it is happening here. You, you have called this abuse abuse. You didn't say, well, it wasn't really abuse. He was a coach and it wasn't really a big deal. Like you're not minimizing it. I want you to know that being kind to yourself right now and you, the husband, being kind to your wife right now is a big, big, big deal. There needs to be a lot of grace and a lot of mercy and a lot of compassion. Um, this type of thing, if, if, if your wife has been told, why aren't you over this by now? This was 28 years ago um, or over 20 years ago, or however many years ago it was. Why aren't you over it by now? Just get over it. Um, why are you just now mentioning it? Why didn't you say something sooner? All of these things are very, very, very triggering. It is likely that you're having some symptoms of PTSD. And it is, it's very common for survivors to have some symptoms of PTSD later on down the road when they start recovering their repressed memories. So A, please consider your mental health. Mental health is real. Your brain is an organ, just like all the other parts of your body. And if, if you were having a heart attack, someone wouldn't tell you to just get over it. So if you're having a mental break or if you're, if you're struggling with mental illness, then no one should be telling you just to get over it. So please take care of yourself mentally and emotionally. You, the husband, please be compassionate and kind toward your wife. And the last thing in the whole world your wife needs to hear right now, not that you would ever say any of this because clearly you're amazing, like you're sending this email, but the last thing your wife needs to hear is that it was a long time ago and she just needs to get over it or that she needs to report it in order to get better and to feel better because neither one of those things are true. The shame that she is carrying is likely huge and there's no need for her to go through some big trial and have all of that shame piled on top of her again because abusers, especially in this particular situation, which I have a little bit of experience in, they rarely ever admit it. Um, so I want to just hold a safe space for your wife and just say, you are safe here. You can heal here with us. You can come, you can share, you can cry, scream, um, you know, send all the asterisks and, and exclamation points you would like or any of the F-bombs or everybody's really just um, open and respectful of one another and all of our safe groups. So um I, I want you to just feel supported and I want you to know that um, the benefits of reporting are only personal. It doesn't accomplish anything to report it unless you, the survivor, believe that reporting it is something you need to do in order to feel better. So I advocate you reporting the abuse. If that's something you feel strongly about, go you, high five. But if you are agonizing over it and you feel fearful, no one needs to tell you what you need to do. You don't need to report it. So um, there is another video, Harriet. If you could pop up a thumbnail to when, you're, when your abuser denies your abuse. Um, 
that's a really helpful one as well because it's likely um, I have a gut feeling that if your wife were to come forward and share what happened to her that there would be a slew of other people that said me too me too me too me too and it would be a big 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 deal that's usually what happens but I'm not psychic and I don't want to be so you my dear the survivor you are my you are my priority and I would say you need to guard your health guard your mind um, really practice some healthy quiet time and if you are a, a woman of faith and you believe in the power of prayer cast those cares um, maybe do some journaling um, no one's going to be able to wave a magic wand and heal you and make you all better the, um, reporting it won't do that um, saying uh, saying a little prayer isn't going to help that I'm, I'm a woman of faith and I believe in the power of prayer but there is no magic wand there's no magic pill there's no there's no Jesus band-aid for this and it this takes time and it's a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of compassion and a lot of support. So I want you to have the best possible support you could possibly have, which it sounds like your husband is extremely supportive, and or he wants to be. Um, my husband wants to be extremely supportive, even if he doesn't know how sometimes. <laughs> so the fact that your husband wants to be supportive, and it looks like he's doing a great job, then that's wonderful. Um, I would just I would love for you guys to send me a follow-up email and let me know how you're doing or if you want to get plugged into a safe group so that you're surrounded by other people who get you um, when you're surrounded by other people um, that that have lived your pain it really helps because you don't feel minimized and you don't feel like a fool for struggling <laughs> which a lot of us struggle with that so um, I hope that helps and um, again, high fives all over the place for your husband who sent this letter because, wow, you know. Um, so I hope that was helpful, you guys. Um, that's a really big deal. I have some other, um, and thank you for being so brave as to send the email to want to help your wife. Um, I have a, I have another, I have more questions here. Several. How about this one? I hope you can see that. Okay. I'm not sure. So this, this is in response. I posted a question in some of our groups. And um, one of our groups, I posted this question. I said, hey, I'm, I'm looking for some topic suggestions. Please let me know any questions you might have regarding your healing journey um, from childhood abuse. So this is the these are the responses. I'm not sure if you have one on this yet oh, they're talking about videos if you've like if you've done a video on this topic yet I didn't see it but how about managing low contact when you are not legally or physically able to go no contact so just some context here um, managing low contact involves a lot of healthy communication and a lot of willpower and a lot of support you have to have a really strong support system so it's on topic of communication you guys and these buzzwords here low contact and no contact those are very, very um, common phrases used if you have um, studied narcissistic abuse. I'm not talking about like a harmless narcissist who likes to stare at himself in the mirror like they show in the movies. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone who is uh, perhaps sociopathic or psychopathic in nature, lacking empathy, lacking a conscience, someone who is manipulative. Um, and this person who is responding to my offer to um, record videos wants to know how to manage low contact when they're not legally or physically able to go no contact with this other person. Um, and then a person um, responded to that person and said the boundaries video touched on it, but it didn't go into how to manage flying monkeys and it didn't touch on the emotional reality of it and the mourning that happens, at least for me. So again, a couple of buzzwords. So boundaries, I'm gonna talk about boundaries here. Um, managing flying monkeys. Flying monkeys, if you're dealing with a toxic family of origin or a narcissistic family of origin, flying monkeys are usually loved ones, friends, or family members that are outliers. They're the ones that are involved in your family of origin, but they're not, um, they're the ones that are enlisted by 
the toxic person. So someone is manipulating you and they can't get to you because you're ignoring them or for whatever reason, they enlist other people, kind of like a smear campaign. Like they try to enlist other people to see their side of it so that you are bombarded with other people telling you the same message that this, this um, disturbed individual is telling you. So, and then um, again, so that's flying monkeys and then emotional reality of it. That's the emotional reality and the mourning or the grieving that goes along with the fact that you've actually been abused. That's huge. Hey, Harriet, if you could please, please pop up a thumbnail of the video that um, was done recently back in December. And the title of it is how to deal with the reality that you were abused. Um, that's a really, that was a two hour holiday special <laughs> um, on how to deal with the reality of like accepting the fact that you're abused. That, and there's also, and if you could put up another thumbnail from last year's holiday special, Harriet, um, on the topic of predators, because what we're dealing with on this particular topic of conversation and communication here is how to manage low contact with someone. Um, and, and when we're managing low contact, it's usually with someone who's, who's predatory in nature. So the thumbnails that I would love, Harriet, are predators from last December of 2016 or 15, and then accepting the reality of our abuse from December of 2016. So December 2015, December 2016. Thank you so much. Okay, so if you're on a replay, you should be able to see thumbnails and you can click on those and watch those, but you gotta have like a long time. Um, you could also look for the one page because it's a concise version of it. Um, so the mourning and the grieving and the emotional accepting the reality and then managing the flying monkeys and then establishing healthy boundaries and all of this to deal with the fact that we're going to be managing low contact. So lo first of all, what is low contact? Okay, if you are trying, if you're in a relationship or you were in a romantic relationship with someone who's personality disordered, then going no contact or cutting off all communication is, is preferable. Like no email, no social media, no texting, no pop, pop bys, they're just gonna pop by and see you. But if you have to be in contact with this person because you are co-parenting, like you're the father and the personality disordered individual is the mother, or if you're the mother and the personality disordered individual is the father and you both have a child together, then going low contact is the next best thing. And if you guys have not seen the video by Richard Grannon that talks about gray rock, then you need to. If you all, um, Jack, if you could put in the Storify um, a link to Richard Grannon's gray rock video, that would be super amazing because this is what you're gonna need in order to manage low contact. Gray rock is the only thing that works. That bears repeating, I will say it again. Gray rock, while you're managing low contact with a narcissistically personality disordered individual or someone who is sociopathic or psychopathic in nature, predatory, manipulative, cannibalistic, the list goes on. You must master gray rock. Now, gray rock is, is very little emotion. You're only responding with the least amount of emotion and the least amount of words possible in order to accomplish what you need to accomplish. Gray rock is not being snotty. Gray rock is not being rude. Gray rock is not being um, unkind. That's not gray rock. You're giving them what they want if you're rude and unkind. You're giving them exactly what they want. All the narcissist wants is to be the biggest hero in the whole wide world, and if they can't be the biggest hero, they must be the biggest victim. So if you're being mean to them and rude or short with them, you're giving them fuel. It's like the second best milkshake. Like their very favorite thing in the whole world is for you to um, do whatever, you know, be able, allow yourself to be manipulated by them so that they can, you know, they can um, control you. But if you're not falling for it and you're deciding to just be silent, give them the silent treatment or be curt or rude or short 
or um, dismissive or, or whatever, it's the second best thing. You're doing exactly what they want you to do because then they get to play the victim. Then they get to enlist the flying monkeys and go, did you see that? Did you see how she was treating me? Did you see I was only trying to be nice to her and she was being rude to me and she was giving me one word answers and, and with, with, a, with a tone and with an attitude. Did you see that? And then so they enlist the flying monkeys. They get other people thinking that you're the bad guy so they can play the victim. So you're giving them what they want. So you have to master gray rock. Gray rock is neither emotional nor rude. Gray rock is simply bland. You're unaffected. You're blissfully unaffected by them. They can be rude, 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 or they can be nice, 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 and, and they will not get a response out of you. You will be emotionless, and it won't hurt you. You won't be hurt. You won't be excited. You won't be joyful. You won't be mean. You're just gray. You're just there. If they send you three paragraphs as to in an email of what they want you to do to pick up the kids, then your response should be three words. Thank you so much, or I guess that's four words, or absolutely, thank you, whatever. The least amount of words possible with the least amount of attitude or emotion possible. That's gray rock. And gray rock is neither nice nor mean. Gray rock is neither emotional or or rude, again, gray rock is just gray. Now, this does not happen overnight because if you read down here on this area of uh, the emotional reality and the mourning that happens here, you guys, oh my gosh, it is devastating to realize that you have been played and that you've been a pawn, and that you've been manipulated, and that someone's been unkind to you, and that they were setting you up to treat you poorly, or whatever it is that they were doing. It is devastating, devastating. And so you will likely grieve. And if you don't grieve, if you just stuff it, like, I gotta keep it together, ain't nobody got no time for this, I'm just gonna keep it together. And guess what, you are gonna melt down. And guess when you're going to melt down? You're going to melt down at the least opportune time is when you're going to melt down in front of the kids, in front of your family, in front of the whole soccer team, whenever, in the middle of a pizza party, um, when your, your kid's team wins the game, like that's when you're going to have the meltdown because you stuffed it. Again, if you've been on this channel for any length of time, you know when we numb, stuff, and avoid, we suffer. So don't numb the, the pain from being discarded and manipulated and treated poorly. Don't stuff it by saying, I don't have any time for these emotions right now. And don't avoid it by saying, it's okay, I'm totally fine. It's all good. I'm gonna live in some denial right now because denial feels really, really good. Um, don't do those things. Feel your feels, you guys. Allow yourself to go, wow, I am so completely devastated that I was discarded so easily by my wife or husband or mother or sister or cousin or fill in the blank best friend whatever like allow yourself to ball your eyes out if you have to or or punch the punching bag for a good 20 minutes or go for a run or um poke pins in a little you know little voodoo doll or whatever it is that you guys you know do that that lets you get your whatever you need to do i know that i remember my uh, my christian counselor she had a, a screaming pillow she wanted me to scream into a pillow and get all my anger out and i was like i don't have any anger i hadn't accessed my anger yet so and that's a whole nother video but um yeah the only way to manage low contact is gray rock period um it just it just is. It's the only thing that works. If you can't go no contact, you have to use gray rock. And the flying monkeys are going to drive you crazy because you thought they were your friends. They were your besties. And guess what? They've all of a sudden bought into the lie that this person is saying that you're the bad guy or that you've done something wrong. That is devastating. And the mourning and the grieving that needs to happen and really accepting the reality that you've been played, that is huge. You're going to need, need, need to allow yourself to feel those feelings because man, is it painful. And then again, this goes back to communication. If they send you 
two paragraphs on on this you know barrage of manipulative language and whatever just come don't respond immediately out of emotion pause pause come back to it walk away come back to it um, don't respond to anything a narcissist sends you in the heat of emotion allow yourself to process it and really discover your wise mind nurture your wise mind be mindful um, if you guys are not familiar with dialectical behavioral therapy it's a it's sort of a offshoot of cognitive behavioral therapy and DBT is wonderful for learning mindfulness and learning best practices that help you lead a satisfying, healthy, awesome, emotionally fulfilling life. And I highly recommend it for anyone who's been narcissistically abused because, man, you feel like you are going crazy. So I'm going to move down here to this, um, this area here, this question. Um, hopefully you can see what I'm doing. I don't know if you can see that, but... Um, this says, the next question, for me, my greatest problem at the moment is containing my talking. It is a side effect of my upbringing, spent so many years like a mute, that I've gone into another extreme. And I want to be able to contain my talking because it feels like my thoughts are not contained in my head. And it all comes out by talking. And I want to gain some control because sometimes it feels like my mouth has a mind of its own. So in a nutshell, I guess you could call that self-control. So this is great. This is perfectly on topic for communication. Let me take a drink of water, you guys. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, I'm going to address a few things here. So when you grow up in an environment where your voice is not nurtured and appreciated and valued, that sets you up for all kinds of, of drama and toxicity in your adult years. We must, during a young age, be communicated with from someone we love, from someone we trust, from someone who is a caregiver. We must, we must receive nurturing. We must be told that we matter, that our voice matters, that we matter, that we're valuable, that we are, that our existence is valid and that it matters. And we have to have our voice appreciated and, and we need to be told that, that, that our voice is significant and unique. And, you know, if no one's ever told you that, if no one's ever said, you are a miracle, you are a miracle your voice is beautiful, it matters, then I want to be someone who tells you that right now. You matter. Your voice matters. And for you to be silenced during your upbringing and told, um, and you, you, know, you felt like a mute, um, I, I can relate to this, you guys. I can relate to this. Many of you have heard this story, so I'll be really brief. But I was told by one of my abusers that every word that came out of my mouth was meaningless drivel. I didn't even understand what that word meant. I thought it was like dribble, like I was drooling or something. I was not, my voice was not nurtured. It was not appreciated. My existence was not validated. I was told over and over and over again that I should have been aborted. And I hated being alive for years because the, the people who were supposed to love me and care for me were annoyed by me. I was, I was a nuisance. I was a nuisance and I was barely tolerated is, is the truth of the matter. Um, and I, I wasn't, my voice wasn't honored or paid attention to or cared about or nurtured. And I was never told that my voice was beautiful or that it was significant or, or anything. I mean, so this is hard and and you know sometimes we do go to that other extreme in our adult lives by talking and it is very common for us to feel like our thoughts are not contained in our head and that it all just comes out and you know sometimes this this takes a lot of practice it doesn't just happen overnight like this is something that will take time and practicing healthy life skills in a group a safe group of other individuals that have lived your pain people who are safe that are not going to make fun of you, bully you, exploit you, 
be unkind. Like that's, that's huge, huge, huge. If you want to be plugged into a safe group and, and have your voice mean something because your, your voice is special and it matters, please go to the about section of our YouTube channel and there's an easy little like one, two, three, and you just follow that and I'll get you plugged in. Everything's anonymous. Um, it's safe. No one will know about it. it. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's wonderful. So I want you to receive the support you deserve. This person that left this message here for this topic is in one of our safe groups actually. And, and they transparently shared that they want to be able to contain their talking because it feels like their thoughts are not contained in their head and it all just comes out in a big blur and they want to gain some control. And, and this, I want to say honestly, in an, in an effort to make this as valuable for you as possible, I would say, you know, it would be really worth looking into, well, first of all, you guys know I always recommend the book Safe People and the book Boundaries. They're both really helpful books, Safe People and Boundaries. Um, and then honestly, just practicing communication. Some of my clients, I've had some of my clients, they, they literally don't feel comfortable asserting themselves in any way. They have a, a huge fear of rejection when they speak. And so they end up being quiet. Or when they do speak, it all just comes out wrong. And so once or twice a week, I have them go and do little things, whether it's go to the Starbucks and order uh, a tall mocha or go to the bank and withdraw $10 or whatever it is, like interacting with other humans, people that can't tell you no. If you walk up to a place and you're ordering something, they can't tell you no. They can give you pounds of attitude, but they won't tell you no. Like, may I please order a tall mocha? Well, of course. Would you like whipped cream on that? And you'll have to know, like, do you want whipped cream or not? And sometimes it's hard for us to know. Do I like whipped cream? I don't even know. I was never allowed to have that. Or, you know, going to the bank. May I please deposit, you know, this paycheck? Or may I please withdraw $10? Or, or whatever it might be. Just practicing, doing the little things and doing them over and over and over again. These things seem small, but they're big. The small things actually are, are the big things, you guys. Um, so I hope that helps. And I hope that answers your question. Um, as far as feeling like you have no filter because your thoughts are not contained in your head, the only thing that helps this for me and for many of my clients is journaling. And if you don't like your handwriting because you were told that it was ugly when you were little, first of all, I'm so angry with that person who told you that because your handwriting is likely beautiful. And even if it's not, no one should tell you that. It's just wrong. But, you know, you can type. You can even use your phone in the notes app or something and, like, text it. Or there are so many different apps that are free and you can journal your thoughts or you can even do talk to text. You can talk into your phone and it will, it will type things out for you and then you get to laugh because they get the, they get the words wrong. So practicing in, in, in private so that in public you feel safer, that's going to help you a lot with your communication. So I hope this has been helpful for, for all of you. I'm gonna move on to the next, um, the next slide share. I hope that that was uh, helpful for you guys. Um, let me see if I have any questions, um, from you guys right now. Yay. You could, I'm loud and clear and you can see the screen share. Yay. Um, let me see. I hope I have answered everything. Um, let me see. Sorry for the delay, you guys. <laughs> um, oh, bye, Charlie. I'll see you next week. Um, yes, um, Shane says, OMG, it took me years to order Starbucks myself. You're not alone. It's... It's, it's kind of a survivor thing. It's kind of a, you know, if you have lived through child abuse, it's hard to know um, what to do and how to do it. Um, let me see. Hey, Jen. 
I relate to the lack of nurturing my voice. I still have trouble speaking up, even to say something simple like this tweet. Yeah, you're not alone, girl. Seriously. Um, it took me so many years. Communication is not something um, that is learned overnight. I remember um, there was this person from my high school, and we connected on Twitter, and I transparently shared with him, and I said, it's taken me a really long time to sort of find my voice. I mean, when I was in high school, um, I was socially inept. And his response was, oh, so you're all better now. Good job. <laughs> like, super sarcastic. I'm sure he meant it in like a, like, we were all inept, you know, type of a thing. Like, he was being supportive, but, um, but it was... <laughs> Hard for me to receive it that way. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, welcome, Scarlett. I don't know if Scarlett's ever been with us on a Monday night. Hi, Scarlett. Um, does anyone else ever feel afraid that if they let go of shame, they will lose humility and empathy and forget how to be good? Yes, Scarlett. Oh, my gosh. That's one of the lies our abuse tells us. Um, we feel like if we release the shame and we allow ourselves to feel good that we're going to turn into our abuser. And I want to tell you, it is likely that you will never turn into your abuser and you will never lose empathy and lose compassion because for the very reason that you're sending this tweet, like, no, you are, you don't have the same makeup as, as a predator does. So, um, then, so I hope that helps. I hope that helps. I'll answer as many as I can. Then he says, um, we also weren't allowed to talk. So now that we can talk, our mouths sometimes move on their own. I get that. I get that too. In fact, you know, you guys, I'll share this with you transparently. <laughs> Something magical happens when you decide to heal in public on a YouTube channel. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll share with you, um, there were many people um, in like the early parts of our, our community um, they were parts of our groups and now they're no longer parts of our groups or whatever. Um, they said behind my back to some people, yeah, Athena is just r ridiculous or whatever. Um, and, and one person said, she just likes to hear herself talk. Uh, she just talks so much. She just likes to hear herself talk. And it was like, oh, <laughs> it was like a dagger to my heart because like, I don't mean to just talk to hear myself talk. Like I'm actually, I'm actually thinking out loud. I'm actually trying to figure out an intelligent way to say something because, again, I had no vocabulary other than F words and, like, made-up curse words um, until I was, like, 20. <laughs> so, I mean, I had, like, the vocabulary of probably, like, a fifth grader up until I was 20 years old. I mean, I, I could fake it obviously. But I mean, anyway, it was so devastating for me to hear that. And then they just sort of disappeared and they were no longer involved in any of our groups or whatever. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that person um, th like thought that about me that I just like talked to hear myself talk and whatever. And like, they just don't know me. Obviously that person doesn't know me and they don't know that they devastated my whole world and that I'm still wounded by it. <laughs> but um I'm trying to see if, uh, yeah, feel the feels. Meltdowns are so fun. Not. <laughs> oh. oh, Shane says, being gray rock sounds like being Vulcan or liberated Borg. And I, hashtag Trekkie. <laughs> I was raised by Trekkies. So, yeah, um, it kind of is. Or if you guys remember Star Trek The Next Generation, if you remember the character named Data, yeah. That's kind of what gray rock is. You're kind of like, yes, no, thank you. But not like in that exact from Star Trek way. You're just kind of like, you sort of like, huh? Like go with the flow. Like, oh yeah. Like nothing affects you. Or what's that phrase? Water off a duck's back? Yeah. Um, August says, can I go low contact without telling someone? Don't they deserve to know? August, I hope you're still here because this was 20 minutes ago and I missed your question. Oh my gosh. I didn't go no contact or low contact because of this. I was like, 
I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And so I don't want to go no contact or low contact because I'm a horrible human. And I mean, I, I vacillated and just tortured myself and agonized over going low contact or no contact. And the answer is if the person that you're going low contact and no contact with is a person that deserves your love and attention and, and th because they've shown you unconditional love, then it's likely you're not going low to no contact with them. But if the person you're going low or no contact with is someone who's manipulative and, and um, predatory in nature, um, then in order for you to preserve your mental and emotional well-being, it is in your best interest to make that decision yourself apart from someone else's approval. We don't ever want to sacrifice our sanity and our wellness on the altar of someone else's approval. And as Bobby always says, we don't ever want to light ourselves on fire to keep someone else warm. So August, to answer your question, it is up to you. You are the only person who can decide if someone deserves to know whether or not you're going low contact or no contact. I have gone low contact to no contact with several toxic loved ones and never said a word, but my main abuser, I did. I sat down face to face on a Skype. And I just simply shared the, the exact words I said were, for a while, I'm not sure how much time, but for a while, I am not going to be in contact with you. And I would prefer if the only contact we had was via email for a little while. I'm, I'm doing some healing and that's what's best for me. That didn't go over well. No, didn't go over well at all. The person faked a heart attack, and then once they got back up and they were done putting on the show, um, then they had an asthma attack, and then they needed to leave to go get their inhaler, and because, again, they needed to be the biggest victim. Um, and then when they came back and they tried to compose themselves and pretend that everything was fine, I, again, asserted my boundary and said, again, as I was saying previously, when we talk on the phone or on Skype, it is very difficult for me, and I don't enjoy the conversations as much as I would like to. So moving forward, I would prefer if we only communicated by email for a while. I'll let you know. And that didn't go over well. Again, there, was, there were no more theatrics, but um, it just didn't go over well. It didn't go over well at all. It was terrifying, and it was um, the start of the healthiest two-year span of my life. It's been. Um, Two years, three months, and 18 days, I think. Who's counting? So I highly recommend it. And the only person that can say who deserves to be communicated with, if you're going low contact or no contact, the only person that gets to decide that is you. Isn't that liberating? Yes, yes, you, you get to decide. You get to decide when and how to communicate your need. And I'm so proud of you for asking, August. Oh my gosh, I have more questions. I have more questions here. Oh my goodness, I only have 15 minutes left. And I'm already, you know, like this used to be 60 minutes and it's turned into 90. I really should keep these shorter. Um, no one's, no one's um, complained the last month or so. I used to get nasty comments. People would, I even put in the description section of this video today, no need to get rude in the comments about all the talking. Like, I need to talk. So, or as Richard Grannon would say, YouTube is strictly voluntary, darling. Voluntary. So, yeah, no need to get nasty because I'm sitting here talking or what that other person said. You know, Dana just talks to hear herself talk. She's so annoying. Here we go. More questions. Okay. Oops. Oh. Wrong one. 
wrong one. Let me see. Um, I wonder where they went. You know what? I cannot find the other questions. So I might get to end this early for you guys, and then no one will be able to uh, complain. Let's see here. It doesn't look like I have any questions from you guys. The Twitter stream is flying along, and the YouTube chat is too. All right, well, you guys are all good. Um, I'm super happy that this was um, helpful for you guys. Also, thank you for letting me know that you're receiving the resources and that you're finding them helpful. Um, I am so grateful. Oh, Jody just put out a really good meme. You guys, thanks, Jody. High fives. Jody says the biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. And um, yeah, I just want you to know that um, that is one of the biggest communication issues. Um, it is. It is definitely when we. That's one of the things that I think we as a human race. It's sort of we don't listen to understand others. We listen to be understood so that we can start communicating so that we will be understood. Um, but the more we listen to others and we try to understand where they're coming from, um, I believe the healthier the communication is. Um, so I'm gonna need to know what types of communication you would like me to discuss more in depth, whether it's um, professional correspondence and communication, email communication. Um, oh, I might get some questions. Hold on, I might have a couple questions coming. Thank you so much, Matt, you're awesome. Um, oh, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for validating my existence. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Jen. Oh, here's a question from you guys. Okay. Lizzie says, I wanted to know how to tell her school that her behavior is not meant to be disruptive. She just doesn't know how to tell them. I'm assuming Lizzie might be talking about her child, perhaps, and that. Um, maybe clarify if I believe Lizzie's probably talking about her child, maybe her daughter, and her daughter's behavior is not meant to be disruptive. She just doesn't know how to tell them. Um, this was a big deal for me. Um, this was really, re that's really relevant for me when I was growing up. Um, I, I mean, depending on what was going on at home on any given day, oh my goodness. I didn't know how to act. I had no social skills. I don't know how to drive this home any more clearly than to tell you that I was just this abused little girl that had no love and no validation and no kindness and no healthy food um, and very little acceptance, very little kindness. Um, I didn't believe anybody was really there for me. My dad was like my hero at the time because anytime the abuse got too, too bad, he would drive and he would come rescue me, but then he always brought me back. And it was really bad. I remember telling him how bad it was and he always brought me back. And so at the time, I was so enamored with the fact that he was rescuing me that I didn't have the courage to question why he kept bringing me back. Like now, here in my adult years, and my dad's actually um, passed away, like, I'm a, uh, I'm thinking, dude, grow a pair and protect your kid. Like, why did you allow me to be abused repeatedly for years, for decades? <laughs> and then the table sort of turned when I was like 22, 23. 25, I don't know, and then he sort of became abusive towards me. And it wasn't anything I could ever really prove, you know, because he would always be like, I was just kidding, you know. But I, I was always, you know, I was always called fat and ugly and stupid and um, fat, ugly and stupid and clumsy and dumb. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. That was hard. Oh, I got the question wrong. So the question was sent over from Lizzie, and it's about her. Okay, so Lizzie wants to know how to tell her school that her own behavior is not meant to be disruptive. She just doesn't know how to tell them. Okay, um, so if I was Lizzie and I was being, like for lack of a better phrase, blamed or scapegoated at school and sort of labeled disruptive, but I needed to communicate that I wasn't trying to be disruptive, it was not my intent, but I guess, Honestly, Lizzie, knowing myself the way I do now, I would probably pen a letter and ask if I could speak with the principal or speak with the teacher or have like a parent, have like a teacher principal um, conference. Or if this is not, um, if this is in college and there's disruptive behavior going on in college and it's sort of being labeled disruptive, but that's not your intent. College professors are usually really happy when a student has the courage to come to them and address something in person. And if that were the case, I would write it out or I'd practice in a mirror and I would let them know, like, um, you know, Professor Jones, I know that it seems as though I'm, I'm being really disruptive. I want you to know that that's not my intent. And my communication skills might be lacking, but it's an area of growth for me, and I'm really working on that. And I would just love any encouragement or patience that you could possibly offer. Um, it's not my intent to be disruptive. I have a tremendous around, amount of respect for you as my professor, and I, I really want to learn, and I want to be a good student. So um, I just wanted to tell you that. I wanted to let you know. That's probably what I would say if it was me and I was Lizzie and I was in college. If this is younger, like high school, then there would need to be a principal teacher um, discussion. And I would rewind this video and write down all that and then say that. Um, you know, clear communication that is respectful, always respectful of the other person. Again, seeking for them to feel validated, seeking to understand where they're coming from. That's always health. That's the best, the best choice. It's the best practice. Um, and when we adopt best practices and we try to make he the healthiest choice possible, then good things happen. And it develop, you develop healthier habits. And you, when you develop healthier habits, life becomes easier. You almost feel guilty because you have like the, 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 the coolest life ever. Because you're like, wow, life just feels like a breeze. Like, I almost feel guilty because I'm really enjoying myself and life just feels pretty awesome. Like, this is weird. I've never felt awesome before. Maybe I should go back to feeling stuck because I'm so used to feeling stuck. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we start making healthier choices, specifically like mindfulness, daily healthy habits, healthy diet, um, and when we watch our words, you know, we we are only communicating words that are um, that are building up of others, you know, like we were talking about last week, we talked about speaking life and love over people rather than speaking death over their lives. Um, I surround myself with people who speak life and love into my life and not death. They're, I surround myself with people now who appreciate me for who I am warts and all and talking too much and all and I recommend you do the same and um, those are really good best practices like really good daily habits and surrounding ourselves with people who are kind and when we communicate in such a way that we are communicating kindness and acceptance and unconditional love and we want to build up others then that is what I feel we will um, get in return. And if that's not the case, then you need to establish and maintain a healthy boundary to keep those people that are not kind and loving out. So um, I believe that's it for today. Um, I'm probably going to wrap this up. I don't think I have any other questions from you guys right now. Um, 
Yes, I agree with Jen. It is time for some really good self-care. Safe hugs to everyone. Yes. Um, I just want to say thanks to everybody. You guys, thanks for being here. I'm so honored that I get to spend time with you and answer your questions. And like, it's pretty awesome. I got to admit. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me know you're receiving the resources and that they're helpful. Um, thank you for all the questions. Thank you for the all the volunteers um, sending in um, questions and moderating and retweeting and supporting and just everything. Next week, I'm going to answer a whole bunch more of your questions. So um, you can put questions below this video on topics that you think you might find helpful. Uh, post them in our safe groups. Um, again, if you're not in our safe groups, then you can tweet me some questions or you can post them in the comments below this video. Um, but I will be answering more of your questions next week. It'll just be a um, Q&A for survivors of abuse. And there's no topic. It is just going to be um, very valuable Q&A, real life stuff, like emails, tweets, DMs, comments, the questions you guys are sending me. I'll just do my best to answer them. I might do some videos in between now and next Monday and post them here on, on the YouTube channel. If you um, like this video and it's been helpful for you, I would love it if you would give it a thumbs up and, um, and subscribe to this channel if you haven't subscribed already. That would be super awesome. Or is it here or is it over here? I can never remember. Um, but share this video with someone you love if, if they're an adult survivor of any type of abuse. And thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. These videos and our chats can be triggering for hours afterwards. So please practice excellent self-care. And um, honestly, you guys, just do your very best to communicate love. Go speak love over someone's life. Go be kind and generous and caring and communicate clearly and effectively, always thinking of the other person and um, being respectful. And that's probably, that's probably what I'll end on. So I'm Athena Moberg and I love bringing you everything you need for healthy, informed trauma recovery. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. Bye.